Hi, and welcome to Music Fanimal. I'm Tony Lombardi here with my special guest this week, Tony Shuto. Tony, welcome into Music hey. Fanimal. Thank great you. to have you, brother. Oh, man, it's great to be here. It's been a while. We've known each other for a couple of decades now. Yeah. yeah. And I, I want to go back in time for a little bit and talk a little bit about how we got together, how we met. Yeah. I was in commercial finance. I'm working downtown in an office building in one of those executive suites on Pratt Street. And I get a call from a mutual friend of ours, Mark Bullington. He said to me, get your ass down here. And I'm like, where are you? He said, I'm at the horse. Then he plays you playing during happy hour. Five to nine it was a great time down there. Yeah. I miss those days at the horse. Yeah. And you're playing girl. Yeah, I remember that. I remember him having the uh, phone up to my, uh, my face when I was singing. Yeah. And then he told me about it, and I was excited to meet you. Yeah, that's cool. I said, I'll be there in five minutes. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and I was. Now, speaking of the past, I want to talk a little bit about your your career and as you were signed to CBS Records, right. talk a little bit about that experience and and what happened after your signing. Wow, um, it was uh, well, it was a, a rush to get signed because uh, that were that was the days when we were doing demos on quarter inch reels, and um, I got the ears of uh, CBS Records and uh, they liked my music. We couldn't find a producer, and that was the toughest thing. We had uh, Tom Dowd, he listened to it and he loved it, but he was booked up until 1981, and this is 1979 now. Okay. Okay, 1981, he was doing Rod Stewart and, and this, that, and the other. He's been, he was so, so busy. So we had a friend of mine, Steve Dorff, uh, from my past, and he's a great songwriter and a great producer too, and he produced the album. Um, the record company, Island Nights, right? Island Nights, yeah. The record company, I think, focused. They try to make me like a Billy Joel, Barry Manilow type character because I could do that, but I also had a, a edge side that they didn't want to uh, promote. Um, and uh, Billy Joel had already been out, and he had already been successful by that time. So they figured, well, they could clone, maybe have a, a like a, a, a B version of that. And so they put Cafe LA as my first single, and I, it did well in um, many Eastern uh, radio stations, but they wouldn't commit to it. So it, it never happened. Then the second single they put out was a light song to uh, Hold Back the Night. It wasn't part of the edge of what that album was. Like, you got a license to drive me crazy or Island Nights. Island Nights was a, a top five hit in Japan. It was a top 20 hit in Australia. It was already proven, but they, I don't know why they didn't go with that. Captain Wonderful was on that record too, right? Captain Wonderful, but you know, um, that's funny about uh, the demo of Captain Wonderful, we did it in 1978, I think, and it was on the 1970, or 77, it was on the 98 Rock album, and it was pretty much the cornerstone of that record, and um, the demo's better than the album version. The album version just didn't capture that, uh, that feel, that the anger that I had in my vocals and all that. Well, I wanted to ask you about the demos. When you put a song together, you write a song, mm -hmm. and you have an idea, you sit down amongst, uh, I guess it's a question, you sit down amongst the band members, you start to play mm -hmm. maybe on guitar or piano, and, mm -hmm. and then the song takes on a new life. Yeah. Talk about that process. Um, well, in, in, this, in the instance of Captain Wonderful, um, I pretty much knew everybody's part, and I, I fed it to them, but that's the demo. But then when you go out to L.A. and you got Ronnie Tutt on drums, who's Elvis's drummer, you got Steve Lukather from Toto, and you don't sit down and tell those guys what... They just read it off of a chart, and they play it like they read it, you know, and it's, it has no soul. So that song really didn't capture the soul uh, on the actual album that it did on the uh, demo. So when you take a demo in and then it changes, that sometimes it gets better, sometimes better? it gets worse. Yes, exactly. But don't you have ultimate say with that? I do, but I, I was so over Captain Wonderful, you know, because you, you span the life of a song within your head, and you, and, and you love it when you first do it. Because my, my original writing of that song was I was in a bar one time, and, and we were doing a private party for a bunch of businessmen that were talking so loud they weren't listening to us. So I started banging on the piano and singing these lewd lyrics, and <laughs> Captain Wonderful came out of that. So... Um, I had the passion and the fervor back when we did the demo, but you know, uh, when we did the record, it's like, oh, now I want to do, I want to do. You got a license to drive me crazy. I was so excited to do the rest of the album. It was like, you know, it was over with, you know, for me. 
All right, speaking of the passion and the fervor, Tony's going to do one of his originals, and I'll let him take it away. song, Tony, Stronger Than the Wind. Talk about the origins of that song and the meaning behind it. Um, well, uh, that song uh, uh, gave birth on a, you know, a, a train up to Philadelphia from Penn Station. I had my Stratocaster in my lap with no case, and I started writing this little melody on the guitar, and I had a melody in my head of the song, but I didn't have lyrics. So I was writing with a, a young lady named uh, Esra Mohawk. Uh, who was writing with my same company, Famous Music uh, Publishing. And, is that a real uh, name? Esra Mohawk is not a real name, but <laughs> I'm not going to say her real name because she, uh, she might not like that, but she was Uncle Meat in Frank Zappa's Mothers of Invention, which I think is a notable Interesting lady. Thing. Yeah. Oh, she's amazing. She wrote uh, Change of Heart for, um, uh, oh gosh, uh, the girl with the hiccup, Cindy Lauper. Yeah, she wrote, and, and yeah, she, she's a great songwriter, uh, and that's how that song happened, and uh, we um, got it in the hands of uh, uh, Roger Davies, who was producing uh, Tina Turner, and it, it was a B-side of one of her hits in England, and uh, it's a great, I mean, I, it's a very special song to me, the lyrics. You talked about some of your edginess, and then there's a softer side with the acoustic and the piano. Talk about some of your musical influences. Wow. Um, 
you know, I, my, I had my ear to the radio as a, a, a young boy uh, way before I saw the Beatles. Um, you know, Dion, uh, The Four Seasons, uh, uh, Johnny Cash, Johnny Tillotson, all that stuff. And then when the, I saw the Beatles uh, on the Ed Sullivan show, it just blew my mind, you know, because it was so immediate. I mean, they were so raw, and uh, it just gave me another uh, reason to play music and be, it was... The irreverence that they had just, it gave me the inspiration to want to do what they did, like millions of other musicians in this world. Um, and then I went to see them live uh, at the Baltimore Civic Center, and uh, that did it for me. I just said, this is my career right here. I was 11 years old. You know? <laughs> That's awesome. Now, yeah. you've had a Beatle experience, really, because you've been such a success in Japan. Talk about that success in Japan and some of your hard days and nights experiences over there. Well, the first time I went to Japan was in 1981, and I had a top five hit and, and top ten album. And, uh, you know, it was the limousines and the young girls rushing the limousines, throwing roses, you know, at the, the car and all that. And you thought and, back when you were 11, I knew I wanted to get into this business. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, for me, I, I had accomplished my dream, even though financially I never really accomplished what I could have. But I, it, it's really about my dream, and, and that, that was so satisfied that way. And also, we, when we played in Osaka, we did the whole country of Japan the first time. And Osaka was great because they, had, um, they were rushing the stage. And I was told, don't get um, upset if people don't clap, because the Japanese are very subdued. And then when we played Osaka, we had to have the, um, the security guards keep them from rushing the stage. So that was good. I had, it was a great time. But then in 2012, I went back over, and uh, it was a different thing. You know. They weren't rushing the car anymore? No, no they were probably in nursing homes. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so, but it's still, your music's still popular over in Japan. Yeah, I, when I get my royalty statements, and, and trust me, it's, it's, it's nothing to call home for. But um, I, I, my music is being played in Chile, Spain, uh, Italy, all over the globe. It's amazing because of social media. You know? Right. But, um, you know, but again, it's nothing to lose my day job for or anything, you know. <laughs> now, you spoke, spoke about all over the globe. You were part of a, a band from Australia, the Little River Band. Talk the, about those experiences. Well, that was a great experience. I, I felt like I was a pirate on a ship with, you know, it was 13 of us, you know, the crew and the band. We all traveled together. And, you know, I never really knew their music. Um, I mean, I heard their songs, but I never connected them to Little River Band. Okay. And then when um, I started writing with the, the drummer in 1984, and he called me up in the middle of the night, he goes, Hey, mate, I reckon I want you to be the keyboard player for our band. I said, dude, I don't... And it was in the middle of the night. You know, it's like, dude, I, call me tomorrow. And Where was he calling you from? Australia? Australia. He said, I don't play keyboards. He goes, dude, I, I feel, we wrote music together. You're great. You know, so he sent me a cassette. <laughs> and, uh, and I listened to these songs. I said, man, I remember these songs. And I loved them, but I didn't know they were a little river band. So I learned them. They were easy enough for me to learn and, and um, articulate on stage. So uh, that was fantastic. And then uh, Warren Zevon joined. Um, we were featuring him in the middle of our shows in Australia. And uh, it was great meeting him. He was an awesome, awesome guy. Did he sing Werewolves of London? He hated that song. Oh, my God. <laughs> and we talked about that because I'm the same way about Captain Wonderful. You know, it's like, you know, when people ask me to sing it, I go, I always thought that Kid Rock ripped him off with that song. Oh, yeah, definitely. Song. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. And I'm sure he had to pay. Oh, you know, we lost Warren a, a while ago, and I'm sure he had to you know, pay some kind of a residual right. to his son. You know, but um, that was a great experience. Played all over the world with Little River Band with the original lead singer, Glenn Shark, which to me meant all the difference because he was amazing. And uh, it was a great band. And Peter Beckett was in our band from Player. Uh, him and I joined together. He's an old friend of mine, too. It was a great band, yeah. Great songs, great memories. So, you want to do another song? Sure. Let's do another one. More from Tony Shuto. Look inside the needle hole The glassy eye The smoking pipe The banging rush The pure uncut you can't catch up Look inside the needle hole The shattered dream The mama scream Have you seen enough? Have you seen too much? If hell had windows Would you look inside? Would you hide your eyes? If hell had windows Would you sneeze? 
peek a peek Could you stand the heat if hell had windows? Would you turn away, pull down the shades if hell had windows? Look inside the smoking gun, the blow away Bottles kiss the one you crave. Look inside L7 stare. The dirty air, the death row chair. Have you seen enough? Have you seen too much? If hell had windows, would you look inside? Would you hide your eyes? If hell had windows, would you sneak? Stand the heat if hell had windows. Would you turn away, pull down the shades if hell had windows? I wanna know what evil knows. I wanna know where sin goes. Do you really wanna? Another original from Tony Shuto, If Hell Had Windows. Talk about that song a little bit. It has some dire lyrics in that, Tony. Well, that was uh, co-written with my great friend and lyricist, uh, Sammy Igorin. And uh, it was actually a, adopted for a lady that was on death row. And it was on her website, and she actually got freed. So it, it, it was neat because some of my successes have been you know, kind of off the um, the main stream, so you really don't know. You no, know, a lot of people don't know about that kind of kind of thing, and uh, it's not a monetary success. It's just, it's a pleasure. Like I've had a song in uh, a Christopher Walken movie, uh, Drew Barrymore movie. What songs like were that? they? Well, Christopher Walken movie was called All American Murder, and I had a song called Out of the Darkness. Um, the Amy Fisher story on ABC with Drew Barrymore. I had a song called High Life. Uh, Actually, playing when she shoots uh, Mary Bo Joe Buttafuoco. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, our song's did he, playing. Did right he there. deserve it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so, I mean, little things like that off off the you know the the fast lane path that people don't know about. Um, but the thing with if hell had windows because it got chosen for that website and that campaign to free that lady was, I, I felt it was an honor and it, I, it's a great song, but it's very in and of itself, you know. But those songs you just mentioned, how can our viewers find those songs if they want to? YouTube. I have so many YouTube things, just like everybody else, but Out of the Darkness is on many YouTube uh, sites, and they're not, I don't even put them up there. Other people from wherever put them up, you know. And, uh, yeah, definitely. On a lighter note, you were part of the house band for Full House, the TV show. 
Jesse with and the Rippers. John Stamos, yep. Jesse and the Rippers. Absolutely. Talk about that experience. Well, um, uh, John, I met John in 1984, I think, at um, the Dunes Hotel in Vegas. His, his good friend and my good friend, Gary Griffin, who now plays keyboards for Brian Wilson, uh, brought him out and said, hey, I want you to hear my buddy. And uh, John and I struck up a great relationship quick. He loved the Beatles. He loved the Beach Boys. And he loved Elvis, which... You know, he played I, the drum in the Beach Boys, for, drums for a he while. Still right? does, yeah, yeah, okay. He still does, yeah, he still does. Is he good? Um, yeah, he's, yeah, John's an excellent musician. Um, and then um, he started flying me out to do episodes, and, and he would take me to lunch, and he would say, Tony, tell me about what you do in your life, because you're touring the world with this band, uh, you have two children at home, and that's what I do on, on camera. I'm getting paid for it, so give me some of your stories. Right. So I told him uh, about Japan. You know, so when I, the first time I went to Japan, my, my wife was not happy about that. So uh, we had a little bit of a fight. and So we did an episode called Road to Tokyo on Full House, and it's about my life. And here I'm playing bass in the background. I'm playing the, the part of my brother Michael. <laughs> 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 but um, no, and other things we'd have discussions about. What's it like, you know, raising kids and being in the rock and rock and roll business? And um, he's he was just a great guy, and uh, yeah, uh, I wouldn't trade that memory. It's, it's been a great time for me. And it, whenever he calls me, we go and do it again, you know. And you did it again with Jimmy Fallon not too long ago, right? Yes, well, J- Jimmy Fallon had a little revival of Full House. Right. Yeah. Um, that was really interesting. Uh, uh, we did like a medley of the things that we would do on the TV show, like the Everywhere You Look the theme song and Forever, the Dennis Wilson song uh, that was Jesse John's uh, signature song. Okay. You know? And uh, Hippie Hippie Shake. And... But anyway, Jimmy Fallon, was, he was so funny. He was like a little boy. He's like, well, he comes oh, off that way yeah. on his show, yeah. and I wanted to ask you, he if, comes, if, if as he comes off, is that how he is? He, well, I don't know if that's how he is, but that's what... That's me, how he was that day? He's like, I am so excited. I, I've had more calls than when Paul McCartney was on. You know, it's like, <laughs> I can see him doing the same thing the next day with whoever else was Oh, on. right, okay. Yeah, but I mean, that's his magic. That's what he does, and uh, we had a great time. You know, Jimmy was great, and um, all the full, you know, we had uh, Lori Laughlin was there in the back, um... Bob Saget and and, um, and uh, Jeff Franklin, who was the creator of the show, and it was it was a fun time. And that was in New York at the New York NBC Studios before he went out to L.A. So you've had a lot of experiences. If you were the father or an advisor to a young aspiring musician, what kind of advice would you give them in today's music world? As far as music goes, it's really um, so saturated because when I did it. Becoming a musician was you were a minority. Uh, today, it's like everybody is a musician, and, and you can have a studio. Once Tone Loke had that one hit that he did in his, I don't know where he recorded it, in his bedroom or his kitchen, um, I, people can record albums on their sofas, and, and just as long as you have a fan base and grow a fan base, you know, you can make a living. What I would say would be just dig deep down into your soul and really be honest with yourself about your music and how it comes off and don't uh, compromise because the only way you're going to ever make it is to be as good as you can be at what you do because if you try to follow somebody else's idea of what you think you should be, he, they think you should be, you're not going to end up being as good as you are. Tony Shuto speaking words of wisdom. So let's play a little word association game here, Tony. Best Little River Band song. Cool Change. I agree. I love that song. Revolver or Pepper? Revolver. Best Beatles song that few know about. I'll get you in the end. I like that one too. Vinyl or digital? Vinyl for ear comfort, digital for expedience. Okay. Favorite Sirius XM station? Beatles and Fox News. <laughs> okay, Springsteen or Petty? Um, I wouldn't put Petty against Springsteen. I would put Seeger against Springsteen, and I would pick Seeger. Okay. Is Paul dead? 
Well, he keeps popping up. <laughs> <laughs> fuh you, right? <laughs> yeah, we can't keep him down. He just wants to fuh you. <laughs> yeah, that was an interesting thing, but uh, no, nah, I, I never believed in that. Most underappreciated song of all time. Oh, wow. And now I haven't thought about this. Um, Drift Away. Doby Gray? Is that right? Somebody like that. It's really underappreciated. We're not even sure who sings it. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. Did video really kill a radio star? Um, I think so. Because um, I think what was left in imagination made songs sound so much better. And once you saw the geeky performer, and it just it took your mind off of the sound when you're looking, you know, uh, for me anyway. Uh, having said that, I mean... Uh, Hard Day's Night is hands down my favorite movie ever. And I can never see that like it's boring to me anymore. Right. I, I saw it 37 times when I was a kid, and I can still see it forever. It's so cutting edge. And Help too. I mean, and that was really the, the beginning of MTV and all that. He's really clean, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Paul's grandfather. Yeah. <laughs> okay, last question I have for you. On a Tom Hanks castaway island, you get to take one album with you. What's that album? Okay, and then this is going to be interesting because I am right now compiling all my cassettes of my whole entire career, and I wanted to put them on a, a CD so I can listen to them and reminisce my whole life, and I think that would be the CD. I would take that so I could kind of like thumb through. I'd like through. to get a copy of that. Yeah, <laughs> it's like thumbing through, you know, like... A, pictures you yeah know, like we talked about before music is a bookmark in time I use that line every time yeah. since you shared that with me yeah and it's true yeah and I mean, how many times do you hear a song and it takes you yeah. right to a person right. that you maybe haven't even seen right. for a while yeah but having said that pet sounds to me is is a calming album uh, that that doesn't stir up too many emotions and it's so um, even keel and Although I've heard it so many times, I mean, I still, it's like a pleasure, pleasurable album to listen to. And uh, so that might be my, uh, my pick for, you know, an album that somebody would want to know about, you know, other than the one that isn't out yet that I right. talked about. <laughs> <laughs> Great stuff, Tony. Thanks for joining us. That's Music Fanimal for this week, folks. Before we go away, one more from Tony Shuto. Keep holding on. 